Hi, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to After Karzai, assessing the Afghan elections and the future of the U.S.-Afghan relationship. Uh, it's a Hill briefing and also a public briefing hosted by the Foreign Policy Initiative, uh, a 501c3 nonpartisan not for profit organization uh, founded by William Crystal Weekly Standard, Robert Kagan of Brookings Institution, uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman, uh, former Under Secretary of Defense Policy, and, and Dan Sinor. Um, and um, we're an organization that, that tries to make the argument for continuing U.S. global leadership in matters of security, uh, trade and economy, uh, democracy and human rights. And uh, as part of that, uh, further into that mission, uh, we're, ho we're hosting this briefing today on Afghanistan. And by the way, I know the, uh, the opening speakers, uh, Congressman Bridenstine, they've wrapped the votes. Um, well, I'll start, this, this, uh, I'll just provide a quick overview of the conversation and also maybe it'd be a good time to go through the bios of the, of the speakers. Um, and uh, hopefully Bridenstine will be there. Otherwise, we'll just start with uh, um, Hamid with his briefing and, and go on with the briefing. But as, as you all know, uh, on April 5th, Afghanistan uh, held momentous elections. Uh, there was a lot of consternation, a lot of concern how these would go, um, but they, they seem to have, have, to have gone fairly well, um, all things considered. Uh, of course, there were some allegations of irregularities, voter fraud, but that's the sort of thing that, that, that seems to happen in a lot of elections in that part of the world. And I think on balance, it's been a, a, a success, and we've seen right now uh, interim results in which Abdul Abdullah, former foreign minister, uh, and Ashraf Ghani, former finance minister, appear to have uh, emerged as the front runners and, and may uh, run, uh, participate in a runoff election on May 28th. And it's worth pointing out that this election occurred amid uh, great uncertainties, uh, including the, the lack of a bilateral security agreement between the United States and Afghanistan. Uh, this agreement has been approved by the Loya Jirga, uh, Afghan's representative body, but President Karzai for a variety of different reasons, which our speakers will discuss, decided to punt on approving or disproving it and leaving that decision to his successor. Uh, and uh, if no decision is made uh, soon, there is a risk that uh, U.S. troops uh, may pull out completely by the end of the year, though it, it's clear that the, uh, many in the uh, current administration want U.S. troops, uh, at least some presence, uh, after 2014. Um, in addition, uh, another uncertainty that, that the elections faced uh, was a security situation. In particular, there were worries that the Taliban and other groups, violent extremists, might try to disrupt them. But in, in fact, what we've seen lately is a, a relative lull, uh, especially in the cities uh, with regarding violence. And, and, and last, a lot of economic uncertainty, which the speakers can go into, but um, given uh, the lack of clarity where Afghanistan will, Afghanistan will be in 2015, in terms of the BSA and the larger security situation. Uh, the economy has um, had uh, mild bumps, but it still has been on a positive directory. So here to help us think through uh, and assess the April 5th election in Afghanistan and where it's going, as well as to think through where uh, the future of the U.S.-Afghan relationship is going, we have, uh, in addition to Congress Brian Stein, who I'll introduce when he arrives, we have four terrific speakers, who I'll just quickly go over their bios. Um, the first speaker is Hamid uh, Arsalan, who is a program officer for Middle East and North Africa programs at the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, D.C. Uh, he travels frequently to Afghanistan and regularly meets with political leaders, um, provincial council members, business and religious leaders, and members of parliament. He also regularly briefs uh, U.S. civilian and military officials about Afghan domestic politics, about culture and religion, uh, about the terror groups. Oh, Congressman Brian Stein's here. Uh, please, please, please come on. Um, thank you. We were trying to uh, move the ball forward while uh, while you were getting rid of uh, getting the votes. So, um, if I may introduce you very quickly. Um, thank you. Our, our, our uh, speaker has come. Uh, Congressman Jim Brian Stein, who um, uh, was elected to serve in Oklahoma's first district in 2013 as a member of the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, Congressman Brian Stein is a Navy pilot and a combat veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Uh, thank you for your service. Um, after graduating from Rice University uh, with a BA in Economics, uh, Business, and Psychology, he joined the Navy, became a fly, and, and flying combat missions off the USS Abraham Lincoln in operation during freedom in Afghanistan, in Operation Southern Watch in Iraq, and Operation Shock and Awe in Iraq. Uh, later, he transitioned to the F-18 uh, Hornet fighter at the Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center, the parent command of Top Gun, where he flew Red Air as an instructor. He subsequently got an MBA from Cornell and then returned to Tulsa, where he was a, a community leader, uh, and, um, and he was elected again in 2013. So thank you very much for coming and, and offering your comments thank about you. Afghanistan. So when he said I was elected again in 2013, people are saying, what election was in 2013? <laughs> well, I uh, just went unopposed. Uh, so so I, got, I got elected in 2012, and uh, we got elected already again in, in, in 2014. So uh, we're pretty thrilled about it. But uh, thank you for the great introduction. And um, I'd like to just kind of share some of my experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq and why these uh, regions are so important to our country and to the world. Um, when I first uh, got to my first fleet squadron, the AW-113, it's an E-2 Hawkeye squadron, uh, in Point Magoo, California. Raise your hand if you're familiar with what an E-2 Hawkeye is. It's, uh, it's like an AWACS, if you're familiar with an AWACS, it's, uh, it's, it's got a big radar dish on top that spins around and it can see targets from miles away. But it's small enough to take off and land on aircraft carriers. So it's a two-engine turboprop. It's got a radar on top. And, uh, and I just got my wings of gold. I went through uh, the replacement air group, or the fleet replacement squadron, as it's now called in the Navy. Got my wings of gold and uh, went on to my first uh, sea tour. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, September 11th happened, and I deployed on an aircraft carrier called the USS Abraham Lincoln. And when we deployed, we went to the North Arabian Sea. And we flew missions into Afghanistan from the North Arabian Sea. And of course, to get into Afghanistan from the North Arabian Sea, you've got to fly over Pakistan. So what our mission was at the time was to coordinate the airspace for the fighter aircraft that were going in and out of country, for the bomber aircraft that were going in and out of country. And our goal was to support close air support and deep strikes, strategic strikes against the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan in support of our troops on the ground. So we did that uh, for a number of months. And then we rolled over to the Persian Gulf, and we flew Operation Southern Watch in Iraq. Uh, this was before the war in Iraq began, uh, but we did Operation Southern Watch. And then uh, it just so happened that we were, you know, steaming home on Christmas Day. I'm sorry, it was actually New Year's Day. We were steaming home uh, on New Year's Eve. We were steaming home, and we got up on New Year's Day, and we were actually heading in the wrong direction. Well, we were heading back to the Persian Gulf to continue doing Operation Southern Watch in Iraq. And, at the time, we all knew kind of what was happening, and we're getting ready to start what soon became known as Operation Shock and Awe, which was the opening salvo of the war in Iraq. And so we did Operation Southern Watch, and then we, uh, we continued. Uh, we did the opening uh, salvo in Iraq, Operation Shock and Awe, and then it moved into Operation Iraqi Freedom. And uh, interestingly, the Hawkeye is, a, is, a, is an asset that's usually used for air intercept control. In this case, we started a whole new mission. The mission was Airborne Battlefield Command and Control. It's not a mission that we were really trained to, but there was so much interference in the region, uh, electromagnetic interference, that the troops on the ground couldn't communicate with the folks back in the Combined Air Operations Center. The command and control elements couldn't communicate with the four line of troops. So what we did is we started talking to the forward air controllers. And they're now called the JTAC, the Joint Tactical Air Controllers. We, we communicated with them via radios. And we were able to communicate with them where the chaos couldn't because we could get close enough. We would fly right over the forward line of troops and maybe not right over them. If you remember when, when the opening salvos in Iraq began, the forward line of troops was going from Kuwait up to Baghdad. Interestingly, this was the first time in history, the first time in history where we didn't have a carpet bombing campaign leading up to the war. We integrated close air support, and the bombing campaign with the troops. And the reason we were able to do that is because of the precision uh, guided munitions that we now had available, uh, because of the technology advancements that this country uh, really led on. And those technology advancements were not only good for me as a pilot, they were good for the troops on the ground. And we were able to integrate and fight what was, really, uh, at the time, it was the most humane war ever fought. Uh, and we actually had the quickest victory. We, none of us imagined that the victory would happen as quick as it, as it happened. It was a matter of a couple of weeks. 
Now, don't get me wrong, there were insurgents that came in afterwards, foreign fighters from Syria and Iran and other places. If you remember, we damaged uh, al Zarqawi in Afghanistan, for example, and when he was damaged, guess where he got care? He went to Uday Hussein's hospital in Baghdad. So we damaged al Zarqawi in Afghanistan, he got care in Baghdad, and then he started al-Qaeda in Iraq, if you remember that, that period of, uh, of, of Iraqi history. Interestingly, uh, this mission that we did, uh, Airborne Battlefield Command and Control, we had troops on the ground, they were in contact with the enemy, and they had to communicate with somebody, that being us, uh, because we were the only ones they could talk to, and they started asking us for what, what they needed. And we would ask them, what are you in contact with? Is it troops? Is it ground personnel carriers? Is it tanks? What are you in contact with? And what we did inside the Hawkeyes, we did a weapon to target pairing exercise. We found the right bomb to match the right target, and then we'd look at the air tasking order. We'd find out what assets were airborne and did they have the right weapons for that target. You know, you got to make sure you use, for example, uh, you don't want to use a GPS guided bomb to take a tank. Why? Because tanks move and the GPS coordinates are stagnant, which means your bomb will miss. So you need laser guided munitions if you're going to take a moving target. So these are the kind of things we did in the Hawkeye. We found the right weapon. You know, if you have to, depending on the size of the target, what you're up against, you might need a 500, bomb, a 500 pound bomb or a 2,000 pound bomb. You need the right kind of guidance system. Uh, so we did the weapon and target pairing exercise, but then you also had a problem with the fact that there were uh, the aircraft, they had to go deeper into country based on where the troops might have been, which meant that we had to orchestrate a tanker plan, which is very difficult because uh, tankers are, you know, to the enemy, a high value asset. We had to make sure they were protected, that they could get close enough to, to, to make sure that the, the aircraft could get to the forward line of troops. And also, if, if we couldn't get them frontside tanking, we orchestrated backside tanking. But what we did in the E-2 Hawkeye is, is we were the quarterbacks in the sky for the war in Iraq. And, and, and you know, um, it wasn't just tanking, it wasn't just, you know, command and control of the airborne assets to make sure we got the right bomb on the right target at the right time. Uh, we were providing strategic direction for the course of the war based on what we were hearing on the radio and seeing on the, on the radar and, and other things. So, so, so what I'm trying to say here is that what happens in Afghanistan and what happens in Iraq matters to people like me. It's one of the major reasons I ran for Congress when I ran. Because what's, what we see happening right now in many cases uh, is, is problematic, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, we, we saw really the most humane and the most successful war ever fought. And then we watched it kind of degrade as foreign fighters got more and more, uh, and, and, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq and these terrorists got more and more involved in this. And then what we saw is uh, the president lost an election in 2006 and everybody said, look, you gotta fire Rumsfeld, look, we gotta get out of Iraq. And all these things started happening, and guess what? He did, Rumsfeld resigned. But what happened after that? The surge. And everybody said it couldn't be done, it couldn't work, it was politically unpopular. The President of the United States today, who was then Senator Obama, in fact I've got the quote here. In fact, actually I don't have the quote here. But what, what he said is that, and actually I think I do have it, either of <laughs> whether it's quoted or not, here's the gist of his statement. That this has been tried and it failed and we shouldn't try it again. That was the President's, the, the Senator Obama's statement. When, when, uh, when things started unraveling. President Bush said, look, uh, I'm the president, we're going to surge, and he surged anyway. And guess what? It was overwhelmingly successful. Republicans were telling him not to do it. Democrats were telling him not to do it. Uh, and he did it anyway, and it was successful. And interestingly, uh, you know, uh, it came time for the status of forces agreement in Iraq to, to, to end, and the president couldn't get a new, the, the current president, Obama, couldn't get a new status of forces agreement. And so guess what? Our troops precipitously withdrew. And I, I want to read to you what he said. This was Senator Obama in 2006. He said, a premature withdrawal from Iraq would, quote, leave behind a security vacuum filled with terrorism, chaos, ethnic cleansing, and genocide that could engulf large swaths of the Middle East and endanger America. That's what Senator Obama said would happen if we were to have a precipitous withdrawal in Iraq. Interestingly, uh, he went ahead and he campaigned saying he was going to withdraw troops from Iraq. And when he became president, he did just that. And when he came time to withdraw troops, and it wasn't because he wanted to, it was because he couldn't get a status of forces agreement agreed to. And here's what he said. 
He confidently asserted that, quote, these terrorists will fail to achieve their goals. Iraqis are a proud people. They have no interest in endless destruction. This was a complete reversal in his opinion. And what we're finding now in Iraq is that he was right in 2006 and he was wrong in 2010. We're seeing in the Anbar province uh, massive degradation. We're seeing Ramadi and Fallujah controlled by ISIS and, and you know, Al-Qaeda-aligned groups. And now we're seeing it not only in western Iraq, we're seeing it in eastern Iraq. Um, and they're, they're expanding their territory. And the troops that we have, that I say we, the troops that the Iraqis have, um, are not able to, to defend against themselves. And cities are falling. And there's chaos, and the people that are there supposedly providing security are not providing it, and farmers are actually saying, look, we're out of here, and they're leaving. This is creating chaos, and the reason is because we didn't achieve a status of forces agreement in Iraq. And where are we now in Afghanistan? We're in a position now in Afghanistan where we don't have a status of forces agreement. We desperately need one. And now we've had an election, which is good, in Afghanistan, 60% of uh, adults that were eligible to vote voted, which is a, a, a tremendous success. Uh, it is true that nobody got 50%, which is actually quite indicative of the fact that while there was corruption and there probably was some voter fraud, it wasn't so overwhelming that it enabled somebody to win over the others uh, illegitimately. But now we're in a position where we've got to get this status of forces agreement achieved in Afghanistan and we need to maintain at least 10,000 troops, which is what the generals in Afghanistan are calling for, so that we don't have in Afghanistan the same scenario that is now developed in Iraq. And there are too many of us who have served our country, who have shed our sweat and our blood, uh, not only for our country, but for peace and stability in the world. There are too many of us who have sacrificed to watch what happened in Iraq happen again in Afghanistan. That's how important <clears throat> what these gentlemen and lady are talking about here today. And, uh, and it's an honor to be here. Um, I appreciate you guys waiting for me to, to get here and, and make the opening statement. But, uh, but this, is, uh, this is something that is near and dear to those of us who have served. And it's, of course, something that's uh, critically important to peace and stability in the world. So thank you guys for being here. And it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, uh, Carter Bridestein, for uh, helping to put in perspective what's uh, where we are today and what's at stake today in Afghanistan. And uh, again, thank you for your service, both uh, in the military and uh, here on Capitol Hill. Thank you, sir. Um, I, so, moving ahead, uh, I think we'll turn to our speakers, and uh, I think we'll start with Hamid Arsalan, who I, who I just uh, began introducing. But um, just to conclude, he's, he's a program officer at, at National Endowment for Democracy, spends a lot of time in Afghanistan, also uh, talking to leaders in Afghanistan, as well as briefing uh, policymakers and lawmakers here in D.C. Uh, and uh, he's a native of Afghanistan himself, so on top of that, he, uh, he's lived it and knows it. So thank you, Hamid, and we'll start with you. Thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging uh, FBI uh, for hosting such timely events. And also, it's an honor for me to be in such a distinguished panel and also uh, in such a distinguished place. Uh, my remarks will be brief and hopefully to the point. Uh, I, I, I will not be uh, talking mostly about the headlines that you're hearing uh, in the news these days, but pretty much about what really this vote uh, meant uh, for Afghanistan and for the Afghans. Uh, many of you know that 2014 has been a year of transition, as uh, was highlighted by the Congressman and Robert earlier as well. And we are dealing with a number of transitions, including a military transition uh, ongoing that uh, most of the American groups are, are scheduled to leave Afghanistan by the end of 2014 if we do not have a bilateral security agreement signed uh, to have a small residual force to remain in the country and we need to assist, train and advise uh, the Afghan forces. And the political transition, which in my view is one of the key uh, transitions or maybe the, perhaps the most important transition in Afghanistan, on April 5th, uh, Afghans uh, made history. 
as highlighted by the Congressman, more, um, Congressman Brighton, uh, Bright, uh, Bright, uh, Bright, Brighton, uh, more than 60% uh, uh, of the Afghan population of the eligible voters, uh, they participate in around 7 million, uh, which is really significant. I think it's higher than the recent turnout that uh, the U.S. had in its recent elections here, of which 36% of that were uh, women uh, by itself. So the recent vote in Afghanistan indeed was for hope, it was for peace and for stability. The Afghans, by their participation, by risking their lives and lands, uh, they say no to tyranny and terrorism represented by the Taliban and sent the message that they're embracing constitutional democracy, constitutional order and, and, and freedom. I remember in 2012, uh, right before uh, the strategic partnership agreement was signed between the U.S. and Afghanistan. Uh, I was in the country. At the time, uh, people were really, really, really hopeless. They were pessimistic. It was at the time that uh, the surge troops were leaving Afghanistan. And people were really fearful that the U.S. was going to abandon Afghanistan uh, once again. Uh, but in, this, in May of that same year, we had the strategic partnership agreement that was signed between the U.S. and Afghanistan, where the U.S. declared Afghanistan as a non-NATO major ally. And again, I was in the country around that time that really uh, shifted that perception. You know, people uh, were really more hopeful and optimistic about the future of the country, especially that President Obama himself, he went to the country and he signed uh, that agreement that sent a signal to the Afghans that we are with you, and also to the regional actors that the US is not going to abandon Afghanistan. So the recent vote has generated a similar enthusiasm uh, people are once again hopeful that uh, we are going to begin a new chapter of a new relationship, especially with an important country like the United States. As highlighted by uh, Congressman earlier, uh, uh, we, have, we don't have a bilateral security agreement signed uh, yet. And the two top uh, leading candidates, they both uh, agreed to sign uh, such an important uh, document, some of them even mentioned in their first uh, week. Uh, of uh, being in office to sign a bilateral security agreement with the United States to be bring again, you know, to leave, to get away from that uncertainty that is uh, uh, going on uh, in the mind of uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, Afghans as of now. And that to be a new chapter uh, for Afghanistan and for its uh, relationship. Also, the 2014, the recent vote was uh, significant in many other ways as well. One, uh, it was uh, if hopefully uh, the two commissioners they do their job well, uh, we will have a peaceful transition of power from one democratic leader to another for the first time in the country's history, which will be really, really significant. Also, uh, just uh, the days before, uh, a few, uh, a little before the elections taking place, it was in the country, and I had the opportunity to meet with uh, most of the presidential candidates on their teams. And uh, the provincial count, uh, the uh, commission, and, and other members, and you could really see that the Afghans are really in charge of the whole process. We have seen that the Afghan security forces have done a remarkable job uh, in uh, providing security uh, leading up to the election, in protecting the presidential candidates, and protecting the Afghans from in, in the rallies, and they did a remarkable job. On the political front, uh, the commissions, in my view, so far, they have done. A really, a really, really a good job uh, uh, last fall. Uh, one key important uh, that is really key that Washington also did not, did not intervene in like 2009 in the politics of the elections, which by itself it led to a lot of these opposition groups that they come together uh, to go and they push uh, for an election law that was passed uh, by the uh, both houses of uh, parliament and the senate in Afghanistan despite a lot of disagreements from the, uh, from the palace. And uh, uh, the Afghan citizens, they were uh, more uh, aware this time around, they were more engaged uh, in the debates and the, the panels in questioning uh, the candidates that if you're going to be the next president of Afghanistan, what is going to be your foreign policy, how are you going to deal with the Taliban, what is going to be your economic policy. So it really indicated that they are moving beyond uh, ethnic politics and they are more concerned uh, about uh, issue, uh, issue based uh, politics in Afghanistan, which to a large extent we can give a lot of credit to the Afghan media and the civil society and so forth. Um, so these gains, I think the success of the recent elections, we have to really build on that. 
and we have to remember where Afghanistan was. Twelve years ago, I was living in Afghanistan. Then, Afghanistan was an isolated country, and it was a safe haven for terrorism. Uh, but today, Afghanistan is a, uh, a democracy uh, where, where women's rights are protected, where people have better access to better health, better service, education, communication uh, services, and so forth. My time is running out, but uh, just one last point that these hardwood gains uh, must be protected and, and, and consolidated. I think that the, 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 if, if we abandon Afghanistan, as connected by Congressman earlier, at this stage it would be a grave, grave mistake. So the cost of abandoning Afghanistan would be much higher than uh, staying in the country. And I'll yield my happy. Uh, thank you, Habib. Uh, next up uh, is the Honorable David uh, Samuel Seddy, who is currently an independent co consultant and a commentator on national and foreign policy. Um, and he served un until recently, uh, from 2009 to 2013, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs. Uh, prior to that, uh, uh, Mr. Sedney has served multiple administrations um, in, in serving um, from 2007 to 2009 as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, uh, also as a DCM, Deputy, Deputy Chief of Mission uh, in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, uh, as well as a you know, DCM uh, for the United States Embassy in Kabul. And prior to that, uh, you know, I could spend quite a long time uh, going through his prior government service to that. His, his service stretches all the way back to the Clinton years in 94. Um, Mr. Sedney is a graduate of Princeton University and the Suffolk University School of Law. Uh, he's also a distinguished graduate of the National War College and on top of that, speaks Romanian, Chinese, and Azerbaijan. So, sir, thank you for your, for your time today and uh, for your comments. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much for the introduction. My daughter's having a great day. You're really old, Dad. Uh, so, uh, I, I have been around uh, for, for a while. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, the Foreign Policy Initiative for providing this for them. I want to thank all of you for turning out on this rather uh, visible spring day here in Washington. Uh, the day there's many other things going on around. Uh, your time is valuable, and I'll try and keep my remarks uh, to, the, to the point. Uh, as uh, there's a work in the past when uh, I can talk about Afghanistan almost forever, and that's not my objective. <laughs> but I do want to make the point that Afghanistan, for the American people, should be forever. In other words, we have, through our history, not just the, the recent past, but going back uh, actually to the 1940s, we have played a role in Afghanistan that few Americans know that has shaped the culture, has shaped the economy, and has uh, been part of many of the historical events that led Afghanistan to where it is today. Uh, and uh, that uh, goes to, uh, for example, in the city of Washkardan, Helmand, which I first visited in 2002, and the, the local people pointed to little America to me, uh, the rows of houses that looked like they could have been a suburb of Kansas City. Uh, where American engineers were living in the 50s and 60s. Um, and, and that's part of our history with Afghanistan that few know. I think uh, a lot of people here will know what we did in the 1980s uh, and uh, the movie Charlie Wilson's War, while well, there's a little fiction in there, uh, captures, I think, some real truths, which were that we supported Afghanistan and then, in the end, we abandoned Afghanistan and the Afghan people. And as a result of that abandonment, uh, Afghanistan suffered through a civil war uh, where hundreds of thousands of people died uh, after the millions of people who died during the fight against the Soviets. Uh, that background is important for us to know as we look at the incredible accomplishments of the election that Javi pointed out. Because despite that history, uh, despite the history of abandonment by the United States, despite the history and the recent history of hearing leading U.S. politicians talk about a zero option and the need to uh, pull out of Afghanistan and cut our losses and other types of rhetoric. The people of Afghanistan still voted for both change, uh, change from President Karzai and change from the government, the ineffective government that he's been leading, but they also voted for a continuing alliance, a uh, continuing relationship with the United States. All of the candidates have pledged to put that uh, uh, document, the bilateral security agreement that's necessary, uh, they all pledged to sign it. All of them have urged President Karzai to sign it. Uh, 
uh, when the Afghan people spoke uh, last November through their lawyer Jarga and said that it should be signed. They uh, also it, uh, made a resounding rejection of the Taliban. Uh, well over a year ago, the Taliban said the election shouldn't be held and said they would do everything they could to prevent them. They made continued public spokesmen, made continued public statements to that effect. The Taliban realized the importance of words. Uh, and they put actions behind those words. In the three months leading up to the election, the flow of, uh, of weapons, of fighters, and of explosives across the border from the, the staging areas in Pakistan into Afghanistan was very high. The number of attacks uh, on, uh, in Afghanistan increased uh, during that period to a level higher than it had in previous uh, periods of uh, similar uh, January, February, March, uh, April, uh, uh, even though um, there were significant efforts to try and make that stop. Uh, as the Afghan people stood up and they voted. Uh, the Washington Post, for example, on April 5th, the day of the election, predicted low election turnout and that the Taliban would succeed. Uh, they, of course, were 180 degrees wrong. Uh, that may have surprised some people in the United States. I don't think it surprised many Afghans. Uh, that followed an election campaign where tens of thousands of people turned out for rallies. It followed a uh, period of a, a very open political debate. Uh, if you have the opportunity to just take a look at some of the political debates among the candidates, so there were four, four debates among the candidates, uh, they were a real example of democracy in action. Uh, what that has resulted in is the Afghan people have put a huge, huge amount of responsibility on the two presidential candidates. Uh, I know both of them very well. I've spent many, many hours talking to both of them over the years. Both uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Ghani are people who are very sophisticated in the world, and they're aware of the responsibility that this places on them. Uh, Afghanistan has had a history of expectations, so there those who point to that as a possible weakness in the future. Uh, I think I can uh, predict fairly confidently, just as I predicted three weeks ago, the election turnout was going to be much stronger than people expected, that these two people will put their nation ahead of their own personal interest. Uh, there will be dangers of that. What does that mean for the United States? It means we have success in Afghanistan. Uh, despite many mistakes on both sides, uh, on all sides involved, uh, despite pressure from uh, surrounding nations, uh, the sacrifices, and, I, and I'm very serious about this, because our country has sent nearly 3,000 Americans uh, to Afghanistan and didn't come home alive. Tens of thousands have been wounded, and some are suffering, uh, will suffer for the rest of their lives as a consequence of those injuries. This is something that if a country asks its young people to die, it needs to do it because it's in our nation's interest. And we have to be able to prove uh, that it's worth it. If it's not worth it, we should pull out. But what the Afghan people have shown is they want a new future. They want that future with us. They know they need us. Uh, given their neighborhood, Pakistan, Iran, and many other actors, uh, they also know that they, they, they can't do it by themselves. Uh, they want us there. My time is almost up. <laughs> uh, we have an opportunity here uh, in the United States to reset, and I apologize, my uh, technical skills are lousy. Uh, we have the opportunity for uh, a real new beginning uh, with a new president, uh, with a new set of actors in Afghanistan, uh, and an opportunity to show the rest of the world at a time when many people, uh, as some of the, uh, as Congressman Bridenstine pointed out, as, uh, Robert and his colleagues have pointed out, at a time when many countries around the world doubt the United States. Uh, they don't see us as having staying power and resolve. They see us as a receding power, not a continuing uh, and even uh, improving power. Uh, what we do in Afghanistan matters for our, for our country. It matters for our ability to uh, continue to counteract the scourge of terrorism and the threat that al-Qaeda continues to pose uh, from right now in, inside of primarily inside of Pakistan. But I would say mo most of all it matters to us morally. This is a country that we've abandoned in the past, where our actions have led to, through our actions and lack of actions, have led to situations where hundreds of thousands of people have died and there have been incredible abuses. Uh, we have the opportunity uh, to fix it. We've fixed a lot of them. Afghanistan has made more progress in social indicators over the last decade than any other country in the world according to the UN social progress indicators of last year. Life expectancy is up by 15 years. Infant mortality is down by over 400%. I can go on and on. That kind of progress, coupled with a security force that's able to defend the elections the way they did, is, a, is an accomplishment uh, that we need not to uh, abandon, or we need not, we need not to 
uh, uh, be afraid to uh, acclaim as a success and that we are, I, I believe, uh, duty-bound uh, for our nation's interest uh, to continue to support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shetty, for that overview of uh, Afghanistan and sort of U.S. equities in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, next up to uh, talk about the security situation, among other topics, is uh, Dr. Seth Jones, who is an associate director uh, at, of the International Security and Defense Policy Center at the Rand Corporation, as well as an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins uh, School for Advanced International Studies. Um, Dr. Jones received his MA and PhD from the University of Chicago, which is also my alma mater, and some of you may know that there is a, an unofficial motto there um, that's interesting in practice, but how does it work in theory? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jones, um, however, has transcended that, showing himself to be both a scholar and uh, also in his professional service. Um, he served previously as a representative for the Commander U.S. Special Operations Command uh, to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations. And before that, he served uh, as the Plans Officer and Advisor to the Commanding General, U.S. Special Operations Forces in Afghanistan. Uh, Dr. Jones specializes in uh, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, uh, including a focus on Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Al-Qaeda. And uh, if you have a Kindle, you can download all his uh, many books. So, uh, Dr. Jones, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for to the Foreign Policy Initiative for holding this, uh, A, this discussion, but B, holding it here, uh, in part because the whole of the Congress, uh, the support here, I think, is critical for everything that uh, all of us are, are talking about here. The continuation, I think, of the U.S. presence and U.S. funding in Afghanistan that many of us uh, will argue. Uh, I'm also going to note there was also a saying at, at the University of Chicago when I was there. There was a there a number of people who wore T-shirts with the, the Nobel Prize winners in particular economics. Um, there was also one uh, T-shirt where it says on the University of Chicago uh, on the front it says the uh, Chicago on the back it says where fun comes to die. <laughs> <laughs> All sorts of good and bad uh, connotations. That I like. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, break my remarks into two comments. First, I'm going to talk about and build off of uh, David's uh, uh, point at the end of his talk on why this area is so important to the United States. And then I'm going to move on to the security situation, including the elections and moving into the second round, how the election the political process can impact uh, the situation on the ground for good or ill. And I'll, I'll, I'll probably give a little bit of a glass half empty version as well, or at least highlight some concerns that I think need to be addressed as we move into the second round and afterwards. Uh, let me start then with, the, with why we should care. And uh, the, the U.S. cared from the beginning in part because um, uh, was hit on September 11th. Uh, Al-Qaeda, which at that point was based down in Kandahar, um, just outside of uh, Kandahar Airfield uh, uh, now, largely moved to Pakistan, leadership went to Pakistan, some went to Iran. Um, today, if you fast forward, uh, there is still a concern about a number of militant groups uh, operating on both sides of a border, but for anybody that has been there, um, knows it is, is a porous border. I'll highlight two comments along those lines. First is um, the, um, the Emir for Northeastern Afghanistan, the Al-Qaeda Emir, Farooq al-Qatari, continues to operate out of the Kunar Nuristan area. Um, there have been concerns about uh, growing numbers of foreign fighters that have come across the border to Pakistan and conduct training uh, to leave, leave, at least leave Afghanistan. So there's a uh, continuing involvement of um, Al-Qaeda, small, but uh, it is certainly not dead. Uh, I would also note some concerning developments more recently, including the recent Serena attack, uh, which uh, uh, appears to have involved Lashkar and Taiba in the, uh, in the uh, uh, preparations and planning for the attack, which is at least one of the few cases I've seen recently of Lashkar-e-Tab involved in a major strike in the Kabul area. 
Uh, as people know, the background involved in strikes in uh, Mumbai, India, it's been heavily involved in the Kashmir attack. There has been an increase in LT operations in Afghanistan over the last several years, but this shows the, the regional dimension of this. And just to highlight as a reminder, obviously we've, U.S. has concerns of a number of these organizations. The U.S. Uh, uh, embassy has been targeted by the Haqqani Network, which continues to operate in this area. Uh, in 2010, uh, Faisal Shahzad put an ID in Times Square, trained by the Chiriki Taliban Pakistan. <coughs> so the, the issue here is there are a number of militant groups still operating in this region, both uh, uh, Salafi jihadists, which is the Al-Qaeda, and some of the extremist Diobandi groups, that are not going to leave uh, if the U.S. does. And I would further the congressman's point um, that after the pullout from uh, Iraq, these groups didn't just go away. So I think there is a concern along those lines. I would also point out, too, that uh, as we've seen in the 1990s, the range of um, neighbors, most of them that have nuclear weapons, uh, one of them Iran, which has a program, uh, that a burgeoning war that increases instability between a nuclear armed India, and Pakistan, Iran, Russia, China, uh, obviously is in no one's interest. It does have sort of broader regional implications. And then it's been interesting to watch some of the jihadist comments recently that a U.S. departure, if that's what happens, would be, as one senior Al-Qaeda representative said recently, the most significant jihadist victory since the departure of the Soviet Union in uh, Afghanistan in 1989. Uh, so uh, again, I do think there are some important reasons for, um, for staying and some costs to leaving. Now as we look forward, and I'll try and keep my comments brief here, as we look forward, I do think there are some issues as we move into the, into the uh, second round of elections. One of the more interesting ones is uh, we have uh, a uh, Haji Pashtun, uh, presidential candidate, now uh, likely running against a Pashtun. If you look at where the uh, uh, where they receive the vast majority of votes, it's worth noting several things. One of them is that Abdullah, probably not surprisingly, did strongest in the west, Herat, in the north, everywhere from Faryab through Balkh, uh, Kunduz, and then into Barakshan, a little bit around, the, he did well in Kabul, and then about, uh, in and around the Kabul area of Wardak, he won uh, Khazni. But as you get into deep Pashtun south, Kandahar, uh, Helmand, Zabal, and then as you get into areas of uh, Gilzai, a number of Gilzai areas, including up into Nangahar, that's where uh, either Rasul or um, Ashraf Khani uh, did, did well. We have a bit of a of an ethnic division along these lines. And as I've said uh, in, in several instances, um, what I think is probably less relevant to the future of Afghanistan, and certainly be true post uh, the second round, is who emerges as the president and more the consensus that comes out of whoever wins. In other words, probably less Abdullah or less uh, Ashraf Ghani and more what does the team look like? How much consensus do they have among the key uh, constituencies? It's not just ethnic, but among uh, young Afghans and other influential individuals. And I do think we have risk here. Our, I would point to you know, the, the history here of having a non-Pashtun win in Afghanistan is not good. Uh, 1929, Habibullah Kalakani, which was led by a large-scale revolt among the Pashtuns. And then in the early 1990s, uh, the reason I bring this up is I still think there are risks uh, with a second round and with elections uh, that, that there needs to be very important efforts by the Afghans, and there are internationals that can support this as well, to ensure consensus among whoever wins and at least to tamp down, if it's Abdullah, concerns among Pashtuns and neighbors, particularly Pakistan, about uh, implications there. So, to summarize, I think there is a very, very strong interest in the United States to remain engaged uh, diplomatically, economically, financially, and militarily in, uh, in forces there. Uh, but I do think there are risks that need to be addressed, including ones that U.S. diplomats 
and uh, civilians and military officials uh, need to strongly consider which, which will come out in the uh, question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. And last but certainly not least is uh, Ambassador Paula J. Dobrynetsky, who is uh, a senior fellow at Harvard University's JFK Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and chair of the National Board of Directors of the World Affairs Councils of America. Uh, from 2010 to 2012, she was senior vice president uh, and global head of government and regulatory affairs at Thomson Reuters. Uh, and she simultaneously also held the Distinguished National Security Chair at the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, from 2001 to 2009, Ambassador Dobransky served as the Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs uh, and was the, uh, so far, the longest serving in that position in history. Uh, and for her leadership uh, during her, her tenure there, she received uh, the Secretary of State's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal. Uh, in addition, she's held multiple other government appointments related to human rights, uh, as well as uh, uh, women's issues and uh, other security issues. Um, and from 1997 to 2001, she served on the presidentially appointed U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, which is a very, very, very important issue today, public diplomacy. She's a Fulbright Hayes Scholar, a Ford and Rotary Foundation Fellow, and a mem member of Phi Beta Kappa, and a recipient of uh, multiple high-level international awards. Uh, Ambassador Dobryansky received her bachelor's degree uh, in international politics from Georgetown University School for Foreign Service, and her master's and PhD in Soviet political and military affairs from Harvard University. Uh, Ambassador Dobryansky. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased as well to be here and congratulate FPI for bringing this all together. I think it's very timely. I have six points to make in sort of being the pinch hitter at the end here. Um, and some of this is underscoring some of the points that have been said, but let me, let me go forth. Why do we care about the relationship? Why does this uh, matter, and especially at this time? The first is, I would put it this way, the strategic location of Afghanistan. It's a substantial landmass. It's surrounded by you know, the countries that have been mentioned, Iran, India, Pakistan. And there's been traditionally a concern about the stability of the region. So what we do in Afghanistan does matter in terms of the overall strategic fabric of how we craft our policies toward the area. It's in our national security interest to have regional stability. And also as part of this, as you very well heard from Dr. Jones, about the importance of still dealing with and uh, uh, defeating the extremists, whether you have militant groups, whether you have terrorists, but the extremists that will take Afghanistan down and which will also continue to affect the international community at large. The second factor is that we've made, and you've heard this, I think, from everyone, including the congressman, we've made uh, a huge investment and also sacrifices have been made in Afghanistan in blood and treasure. And to abandon, to look away from uh, the current situation and particularly going forward, I think you could say very directly that that undercuts. Undercuts what we have achieved and especially undermines those who have taken on the mission and put them all themselves on the line. So to do so, I think, would be very tragic. The third factor is also been mentioned in some capacities, that our investment has also shown some very concrete results, in other words, some successes. Afghanistan has grappled a great deal with poverty, corruption, drug trafficking, the issue of women's rights, and really being able to advance itself economically because of the constant concern of its security. These elections, which Afghans, I think, can take a great deal of credit for and feel very heartened by, the fact that more than 7 million went to the polls, I think it's very significant. Here you have the first ever peaceful, democratic, potentially transfer of, of power. It'll be significant. People rose to the occasion. I mean, mentioned the hope that people have. I think that's important. So what does that mean for us? There's an opportunity to build on the positive achievements of the past 12 years. The fourth element is the result of the elections. You know, a 
Abdullah, Abdullah and Ashraf Ghani. And I think when you look at their positions, and I say this at large in evaluating their positions, they're generally consistent with many of the kinds of interests of the United States. There's, in other words, a compatibility. There's a foundation from which to build upon. Also, I think that they have a strategic vision and a desire to really advance and reform Afghanistan. That's not to say that in a sweeping way there are ethnic components and other um, uh, factors, but I, as Undersecretary, I got to know both. In fact, let me mention that with Abdullah Abdullah, he happened to be one of the co-chairs of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council when it was first formed. He was the first co-chair along with Dr. Seema Samar at the time and then myself. And then he went on and he was in that position the full time when he was foreign minister. And also Ashraf Ghani also is someone who's quite well known for his uh, vision in terms of economic reforms and trying to really advance Afghanistan's economy. So in this regard, also, I think when you look at the two, the other point is all nine of the candidates, including these two, have committed themselves to the status of forces agreement. And I think that's important. It remains to be seen uh, going forward, but they have put themselves down for saying that they would sign it. Uh, the fifth point, we know that Americans are uh, tired. We have fatigue. But I think that the good news here is that there is a foundation from which to build. I think that these elections demonstrate that. I think that also in this regard that um, there is also a manifestation of the desire and need to advance it themselves, but to look for assistance. So I think in this context, as we remain connected, nevertheless, I, and that's the point here, we must remain connected. But I also think that there is a feeling of this is part of our success and we want to advance it. And in that sense, I, I think that despite our fatigue, it's in everyone's interest. And then finally, I would say this, and it has been, it has been said here in a number of ways, and it's something that struck me. I was going to actually mention it first, but I wanted to mention it at the end as the sixth uh, element. And that is the fact that so many Afghans have always asked the question, will you abandon us again? I remember when I became undersecretary and we had <coughs> the press conference between Presidents Bush and Karzai and the enrolling of many different initiatives in different areas, including the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. At the time, I remember the question that was really stated and restated, and that was, will you abandon us again? And I have to underscore that because and the answer was, no, we will not abandon you again. I feel we do have a commitment. I feel we have a stake. It's in our interest. It's in their interest. And I'll conclude on this note. I can't help. Um, Dr. Michael Smith is in the audience with his wife, Elspeth. Dr. Michael Smith is the president of the American University in Afghanistan, which I'm on the board of. And the only reason I'm citing this in closing is I've gone to Afghanistan many times, and I've also been at the university before Dr. Smith was there, but he has carried it forward magnificently. But what really struck me was the fact that the numbers have increased. And by the way, these students have a choice. They could go to a madrasa, they could go to other schools, but they haven't. They've chosen the American University of Afghanistan. And in that sense, I think, again, it just share, tells me that the future generation, as you so mentioned, is certainly important. They're making their own choices, and they're looking for opportunities, not only to build their country, but to contribute internationally. And that we also have a great stake in. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Bransky. And I know that you said you may need to, to leave a bit early, so please, if you do, uh, just let us know. Um, I'd like to open up for the Q&A right now. And if, uh, raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, otherwise, I'll start it off. Uh, yeah, please, sir. Go ahead. Uh, 
Please, if you'd be so kind, we have a microphone coming. Um, identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, yes, I'm Russell King, a federal employee. I'd like to direct this question to Mr. Bright, or Mr. Uh, Sedney. Uh, our relationship in, to Afghanistan in some ways is similar and different than our relationship with South Vietnam in the early to mid-1970s when Congress cut off just about all aid to South Vietnam and the North had a rather easy job of winning the war. We had a war weary public and support for South Vietnam was not a politically uh, political priority in, in elections, but the, absolute, the result was a holocaust. But Afghanistan, being a landlocked country, is, seems to me more difficult both politically and geographically uh, because it, it, we're dependent upon the relationships of the countries around Afghanistan to, in order to sustain logistics. If, how would you sustain logistics to Afghanistan at a time when we have fewer personnel in the future? Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the parallels uh, with the Vietnam certainly exist. I think some of them are accurate and some of them are what I call dangerous parallels because they may sometimes seem, uh, seem similar but they're different. Uh, but uh, I would uh, agree uh, that uh, in many ways we face uh, the same kind of ultimate decision that we had to face in Vietnam. Do we stay the course or do we leave? And uh, as I indicated before, I, I believe it's very much in our nation's interest and in the interest of Afghanistan and the rest of the world for us to stay the course. On the question you asked of logistics uh, during my time at the Pentagon, that was one of the key areas that I worked on. Uh, in order to balance uh, the previous uh, six years of almost total reliance on supply routes through Pakistan, uh, we embarked uh, upon a multifaceted effort to give us alternatives through the north, uh, the so-called northern distribution network, uh, which involved uh, both uh, air, rail, and truck routes uh, going to the north of Afghanistan through a number of Central Asian states, uh, through Russia, uh, through the Caucasus countries, uh, uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia. And that effort really paid off uh, about two and a half years ago when the Pakistanis cut off all the land routes. Uh, we were reliant on the Northern Distribution Network, and it actually, despite many people's concerns, we were able to uh, not only supply uh, the troops in Afghanistan as well, we actually had better supplies uh, during that period of time than we had before. Uh, after some negotiation, after about a year and a half, the Pakistanis reopened the land routes, although they've subsequently closed them a couple of times, and so they remain uh, they questionable. But as long as we have those two options, uh, of Pakistan and uh, the multiple options through the north, uh, those were options that were sufficient to logistically support over 100,000 troops, uh, uh, and, uh, and we are now down to about 40,000 or so, and we'll be down to uh, obviously quite a, uh, a smaller number depending on where the president comes out and after January 1st, 2015. I think we have sufficient redundancy in those supply lines, uh, but we do depend upon those other countries. Uh, and, uh, uh, but so far they have uh, been excellent, uh, excellent in cooperation on that and uh, I, I think we are in reasonably good shape but you're right to ask a question because it is uh, something that we need to work very hard at. Thank you for your question please. Sir, on uh, the back end, Chris, if you can. Then. Steve Draper, Congressman Pierce's office. What uh, do you think is going to be the uh, plan to finance this government for the next 10 years? I can answer that. There are really two elements. There are really two elements. Okay, sorry. There are really two elements to the financing. Uh, three elements, really. First, the domestic revenues, and Afghanistan's domestic revenues have been increasing every year until the last few months. Uh, then, uh, foreign civilian assistance and foreign assistance to the military. Uh, in uh, May of 2012, uh, NATO heads of state agreed uh, to a commitment to continue to support the Afghan military after, 20, uh, after 2014. Uh, the U.S. Uh, agreed to a continuing major contribution, which is going to be somewhere around $3 billion a year. Uh, our other allies committed to uh, 1 billion euros per year uh, through 2017. Uh, that will be sufficient, essentially, to, if, if everyone, including the United States, carries through its pledges, to uh, support a military and police force of around 350,000, uh, which is what the NATO head of state agreed on and stated publicly they would support. On the civilian side, 
Uh, later in 2012 in Tokyo, there was a, a meeting of all the donors to Afghanistan. They came up uh, with a uh, set of uh, plans for the future. Commitments were made by uh, the United States, other countries, international institutions on what kinds of aid would be provided. And Afghanistan made a number of commitments on how that aid would be spent and benchmarks in terms of fighting corruption and other areas uh, that would be necessary to have that aid to be, to be delivered. Uh, since that time, uh, Afghanistan has met some of those benchmarks, not really met some of the other ones. Uh, countries are by and large, except the United States, we are, we are probably the, the, the country that has fallen behind the most in our uh, commitments through that. Uh, that's something that's going to have to be the subject of some key political negotiations afterwards. So Afghanistan will be a lot relying on outside support for the next three, four, or five years. In the longer term, Afghanistan has significant mineral wealth, significant trade possibilities, uh, and if there's enough security, Afghanistan has a reasonable chance of narrowing the gap it needs in outside support. It's going to continue the outside support for some time to come. I just would like to add, because that was a very thorough and comprehensive answer, I just add two pieces to it. One is certainly in the, as, uh, to use the term civilian or maybe the humanitarian area, USAID and the resources from USAID through foreign assistance has met. And when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, it's been uh, a, a rather, I would say, uh, small slice. I know that the American public usually thinks that our overall uh, foreign assistance is uh, a substantial amount of our GDP, and as you know, it's under 1%. Uh, but secondly, and so those programs matter greatly for some of the programs done in the educational area, the uh, bolstering civil society, so forth. Last, I would just add, one thing that has struck me greatly in being involved with the American University and also the Women's Council is actually the wonderful outpouring of support by Americans. Um, I have uh, been amazed at how that interest has been steadfast. And so there are private sector contributions that also come from this space. Yeah, I'd just like to make a couple of quick comments along these to build on, on, on what uh, David and Paul have said. Uh, one is uh, that it's worth noting, um, and, and Barney Rubin, among others, have repeatedly pointed this out in their work that Afghanistan has traditionally been a rentier state. So uh, it is worth noting that the country has relied on outside assistance for general funding. Before it was the United States, uh, it was Pakistan during the 1990s. Uh, before the uh, Pakistan, it was the Soviets during the 1980s. Before the Soviets, it was the Americans and, and, and the Soviets before that. So, uh, so this will, this will continue. Second of all, we've done some work in a Council on Foreign Relations document on, on the amounts of assistance necessary, and I'm happy to get that to you. Um, did that with an economist on what we were, what we're likely looking at on the security and on the, on the uh, development side. And then let me, let me just finally conclude by saying, look, the United States has provided development assistance and deployed military forces to a number of countries, whether it's Colombia against the FARC, the Philippines against Abu Sayyaf and a range of others, that in my view have a lot less at stake than they do in Afghanistan right now. I don't understand why this is such a big deal at this point. We've done this before. We've deployed forces to a range of areas with a lot less at stake. We have a lot at stake here, as I think everyone here has, um, has argued. And I think the resources required for the U.S., the Europeans, and others have been willing to provide or commensurate with the risks here. Um, on a related note, I'll take one second, I'll take moderator's prerogative here. Um, Hamid, could you talk a little about the next president of Afghanistan? Um, we'll have to probably make the case to lawmakers and staff in some way, shape, or form, his, his intermediaries as to why the United States should continue. What's sort of the, the Afghan perspective on this? Or what, what would you encourage in terms of public diplomacy and explaining why it's important? In terms of the next challenge of the Afghan yeah. president will have. Uh, I think uh, the next president of Afghanistan will have uh, at least four major challenges. One, politically, domestically in the country, the key challenge will be to form this government of unity. You know, a Hoover, regardless of Hoover wins, if it's Hani or Abdullah, reaching out to the other side to include them, I think that will be the biggest challenge that the next president of Afghanistan will have on how to do that, you know, and how to include them. Second, we are having a really an unfunctional bureaucracy in the country. The bureaucracy in the country is really unfunctional. There's a lot of corruptions 
And most of these leading uh, candidates, they run on a message of promising that we will fight cronyism, nepotism, and corruption. And how to do that and how to deliver on that message, I think, would be another challenge for the next president of Afghanistan. Third would be on the economic front. Uh, many of you know more than 500,000 workforce enters Afghanistan jobs market every day. So it will be a big, big challenge for the next president of Afghanistan uh, to deal uh, with uh, that issue domestically. Third, which is really a fourth, which is really relevant to the question on how to convince the international community, it's uh, on the international front on how to reset that relationship, especially with the United States. I think President Carter uh, recently really his remarks damaged the relationship of Afghanistan, particularly with the United States. Repairing that relationship and reaching out, you know, to the U.S. Congress and other stakeholders and highlighting that why Afghanistan is important and why to stay in Afghanistan is going to be another challenge and uh, not to speak uh, about the other regional actors and how to deal with the Taliban, how to engage Pakistan and Iran on the issue and so forth. Please. Hi, I'm Heather Robinson, a PhD candidate at University of St. Andrews. Um, speaking on actually what you just said about engaging uh, regional players and also what um, Dr. Jones and Mr. Sandy said about regional players' involvement and interest in Afghanistan and how Afghanistan fits into the wider security equation in the region. Um, could you elaborate more on the role Iran um, has and will play uh, in Afghanistan in the coming years, um, especially in the context of our impending troop withdrawal, but also um, the outcome of the U.S.-Iran uh, nuclear negotiations that are currently happening? Um, is the U.S. at all concerned about an increased uh, increase role of Iran in Afghanistan? Uh, sure, I can start. Um, I, I think the Iranian role is uh, is probably hit both sides of the uh, good and bad. I mean, on the positive side, um, they've played a useful uh, role and have an incentive to combat the narcotics trade. Uh, they've got a useful um, incentive to uh, become involved in some of the discussions about uh, the regional energy movement. Um, so, uh, and then trade along the just general trade along Afghanistan's western border. So they have a, they obviously have a quite influential um, role and have had a good, a, a fairly good relationship with the Afghan government. On the other side, they've also been involved in um, in uh, providing a range of assistance to um, uh, sub-state actors in the west, uh, as well as in central parts of Afghanistan. Limited assistance to some insurgent groups. Um, so there's a bit of, of dualness here. Um, I think along the uh, sort of the midterm, the next five years or so, I Iran can play a somewhat helpful role in um, encouraging Afghanistan to become generally more stable. I think their long-term interests are probably to prevent, as, they, as we saw in the 1990s, a Taliban uh, government in Afghanistan. They massed forces in the 1990s. Uh, in, out of concern about a um, uh, uh, Taliban takeover. Um, so I think, you know, there are some concerns with Iranian activity. They're the one country in the region that did not support the bilateral security agreement, uh, agreement BSA, everybody else did. So uh, I do think that relationship does have to be managed, but I think overall, uh, Iran can play a productive role in energy, water, um, and a range of other activities, kind of narcotics, they can be probably more helpful than can be uh, harmful. But I think if the U.S. pulls out, Iran, the Indians, Pakistan, the Russians will move into the vacuum of, uh, of Afghanistan. So uh, they'll become one of several countries in the region that I think will compete. Uh, additional questions? Uh, sure, quickly. Yes, uh, quick. Comment and a question for comment uh, following up on Ambassador Dobryansky's statement on the building on victory of Afghanistan. I think I'll just underline that. Uh, after the Afghans defeated the Soviet Empire, 15 countries of <coughs> Soviet, Soviet republics became independent countries, six Warsaw Pact countries, 21 countries were free. It's an incredible geopolitical, moral achievement, one at the cost of two million lives. Uh, it's tremendous. Uh, I feel we have a real moral interest in their success. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, one additional to that, uh, in India, which followed the Soviet planned economy model, you know, model until the Afghanistan erased that model, uh, Gujarat province took off at 14% GDP growth a year ever since. In other parts of India progressed well. It was an incredible step forward for that nation. Again, 
strategically does not be related to the Afghan victory. The question is uh, for uh, David Sedney about the, uh, the growing shift from Pakistan logistics to northern logistics and other logistics, possibly here maybe. Is it time for Congress to revisit the idea of cutting off aid to Pakistan? And that would help provide reduce the to Pakistani interference in Afghanistan and provide, and these resources could be reallocated to building Afghanistan rather than subsidizing the Mullah less from Islamabad. Uh, it's a, that's an excellent question. The role of Pakistan is one uh, that uh, is really hard to uh, it's really hard to overstate. Uh, the uh, uh, Taliban leadership uh, is in uh, is in Pakistan. And the training camps are there. That's where they mobilize funding and weapons that they send across the border. Although, of course, there's a very strong component of the Taliban uh, fighting structure that is in Afghanistan all the time and is, and is very much uh, native to Afghanistan. However, without that tacit support, and sometimes more than tacit support from Pakistan, uh, the Taliban would be nowhere near as effective as they are today. However, um, uh, the situation in Pakistan is very complicated, and the, the ability of the U.S. to influence it, either by positively reaching out or by negatively cutting off, uh, is very limited. Uh, a lot of our aid goes to uh, areas uh, in uh, energy, uh, in health, education, uh, where the Pakistani people are benefited, and I would not, I would not be supportive of cutting off <coughs> aid that benefits the Pakistani people. A certain amount of our aid goes to the Pakistani military. Uh, the Pakistani military has suffered tens of thousands of casualties in fighting extremists uh, in Pakistan uh, over the last decade. Uh, they have uh, done a, a lot of really uh, important things to make the, 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 the result of which has been to make that extremist threat less serious to us, while at the same time, uh, the, uh, the same organizations have supported some of those organizations, such as Rashid al that uh, Seth mentioned before, that the Pakistani uh, government tells us that he's been supported over the years. Uh, our experience uh, with Pakistan, whether it was sanctioned in the 1990s or reaching out with strategic embrace of the Ambassador Holbrook uh, during the first Obama administration, has unfortunately been that we have very little ability to influence either way. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for that. I wish I could say, if we do sanctions, then Pakistan will get better. If we do, uh, if we do additional aid, things will get better. Uh, unfortunately, neither of those have worked so far. I think we need continuing uh, persistence and engagement with Pakistan, however, because uh, this is a country that has nuclear weapons, as Seth mentioned. Uh, it's uh, a rapidly growing population of 180 million, uh, 180 million uh, close to 180 million uh, people, uh, and uh, its role in the future is only going to be more important. Uh, so we have to be there somehow. But uh, I, I don't have an answer on Pakistan. I was hoping Seth did. Thank you for that question. Um, since uh, we, we sort of ran along, so um, uh, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up very quickly. but. Uh, one thing I'll say is, uh, you know, all our speakers today are me talking about uh, a lot of the challenges that Afghanistan people will face. Uh, Mr. Sedney and Dr. Jones talking about a lot of the security, political, and long-term equities that the United States has in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, moving forward, um, especially in terms of economic security assistance and just the post-2014 situation, will, will ultimately require uh, cooperation between both the executive branch and Congress. And I would, I'm glad for all the folks here from the legislative branch, uh, in particular the question back there, about what future assistance would look like uh, from the gentleman. Um, I will point out too, and the questionnaire sort of cited the example of Vietnam. Um, another example I think that's worth thinking about is the example of you know, post-war South Korea. Um, between, and I understand historical analogies are always from, but let me just point this out. Um, from the end of the Korean War until today, if you actually tabulate it all up, and adjusted for inflation. Uh, the United States invested about $35 billion uh, in economic assistance. We now export $44 billion annually to South Korea alone. And I think that sort of speaks to if you do it right, and it's not easy to do it right, but if you can do it right, you can get the executive and the legislative branch working together, and you have a vision. And I'll also remind folks here, Korea, uh, South Korea had a dictatorship at certain points. It was not 
a democracy through and through. It took a long time for them to stumble in the right direction and eventually create a democracy. But if you do it right, there is a chance, you know, maybe it's Vietnam, but maybe it's South Korea. And I think our speakers today have helped us to sort of clarify the issues that both the executive branch and uh, lawmakers will have to wrangle with, and also the members of the public. And so I thank you all for this dialogue. I look forward to future uh, events of the foreign policy issues, but thank you for your time and, and for your attention. Thank you.
such an important uh, document, some of them even mentioned in their first uh, week uh, of uh, being in office, to sign a bilateral security agreement with the United States, to be, bring again, you know, to leave, to get away from that uncertainty that is uh, uh, going on uh, in the mind of uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, Afghans as of now. And that to be a new chapter uh, for Afghanistan and for its uh, relationship. Also, the 2014, the recent vote was uh, significant in many other ways as well. One, uh, it was uh, if hopefully uh, the two commissioners they do their job well, uh, we will have a peaceful transition of power from one democratic leader to another for the first time in the country's history, which will be really, really significant. Also, uh, just uh, the days before, uh, a few, uh, a little before the election was taking place, it was in the country. And I had the opportunity to meet with, uh, most of the presidential candidates on their teams, and uh, the provincial count, uh, the uh, commission, and, and other members. And you could really see that the Afghans are really in charge of the whole process. We have seen that the Afghan security forces have done a remarkable job uh, in uh, providing security uh, leading up to the election, in protecting the presidential candidates, in protecting the Afghans from in, in the rallies. And they did a remarkable job. On the political front, uh, the commissions, in my view, so far, they have done a really, a really, really a good job uh, uh, last fall. Uh, one key important uh, that is really key that Washington also did not, did not intervene on like 2009 in the politics of the elections, which by itself it led to a lot of these opposition groups that they come together uh, to go and they push uh, for an election law that was passed uh, by the uh, both houses of uh, parliament and the senate uh, in Afghanistan, despite a lot of disagreements from the uh, from the palace, and uh, uh, the Afghan citizens they were uh, more uh, aware this time around. They were more engaged uh, in the debates and the in the panels in questioning uh, the candidates that if you're going to be the next president of Afghanistan, what is going to be your foreign policy? How are you going to deal with the Taliban? what is going to be your economic policy. So it really indicated that they are moving beyond uh, ethnic politics and they are more concerned uh, about uh, issue-based uh, issue uh, politics in Afghanistan, which to a large extent we can give a lot of credit to the Afghan media and the civil society and so forth. Um, so these gains, I think the success of the recent elections, we have to really build on that. And we have to remember where Afghanistan was. Twelve years ago, I was living in Afghanistan. Then Afghanistan was an isolated country and it was a safe haven for terrorism. Uh, but today Afghanistan is a, a democracy uh, where, where women's rights are protected, where people have better access to better health, better service, education, communication uh, services and so forth. My time is running out but uh, just one last point that these hard won gains uh, must be protected and, and, and consolidated. I think that the, 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 if, if we abandon Afghanistan, as highlighted by Congressman earlier, at this stage it would be a great, great mistake. So the cost of abandoning Afghanistan would be much higher than uh, staying in the country. And I'll yield my hand. Uh, thank you, Habib. Uh, next up uh, is the Honorable David uh, Samuel Sethi, who is currently an independent co consultant and a commentator on national and foreign policy. Um, and he served uh, until recently, uh, from 2009 to 2013, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs. Uh, prior to that, um, uh, Mr. Sedney has served multiple administrations um, in, in serving um, from 2007 to 2009 as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, uh, also as a DCM, Deputy, Deputy Chief of Mission uh, in the U.S. Embassy in uh, Beijing, uh, as well as a you know, DCM uh, for the United States Embassy in Kabul. And prior to that, uh, you know, I could spend quite a long time uh, going through his prior government service to that. His, his service stretches all the way back to the Clinton years in, in the form. Um, Mr. Sethi is a graduate of Princeton University and the Suffolk University School of Law. Uh, he's also a distinguished graduate of the National War College, and on top of that speaks Romanian, Chinese, and Azerbaijan. So, sir, thank you for your, for your time today, and uh, before you come. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. My daughter's been here, and you're really old, Dad. 
What does that mean for the United States? It means we have success in Afghanistan. Uh, despite many mistakes on both sides, uh, on all sides involved, uh, despite pressure. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's like an AWACS. If you're familiar with an AWACS, it's, uh, it's, it's got a big radar dish on top that spins around and it can see targets from miles away. But it's small enough to take off and land on aircraft carriers. So it's a two-engine turboprop that's got a radar on top. And, uh, and I just got my wings of gold. I went through uh, the replacement air group or the fleet replacement squadron, as it's now called in the Navy. Got my wings of gold and uh, went on to my first uh, sea tour. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, September 11th happened, and I deployed on an aircraft carrier called the USS Abraham Lincoln. And when we deployed, we went to the North Arabian Sea. And we flew missions into Afghanistan from the North Arabian Sea. And of course, to get into Afghanistan from the North Arabian Sea, you've got to fly over Pakistan. So what our mission was at the time was to coordinate the airspace for the fighter aircraft that were going in and out of country, for the bomber aircraft that were going in and out of country. And our goal was to support close air support and deep strikes, strategic strikes against the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan in support of our troops on the ground. So we did that uh, for a number of months. And then we rolled over to the Persian Gulf and we flew Operation Southern Watch in Iraq. Uh, this was before the war in Iraq began, uh, but we did Operation Southern Watch. And then uh, it just so happened that we were, you know, steaming home on Christmas Day. I'm sorry, it was actually New Year's Day. We were steaming home uh, on New Year's Eve. We were steaming home and we got up on New Year's Day and we were actually heading in the wrong direction. Well, we were heading back to the Persian Gulf to continue doing Operation Southern Watch in Iraq. And, at the time, we all knew kind of what was happening, and we're getting ready to start what soon became known as Operation Shock and Awe, which was the opening salvo of the war in Iraq. And so we did Operation Southern Watch, and then we, uh, we continued. Uh, we did the opening uh, salvo in Iraq, Operation Shock and Awe, and then it moved into Operation Iraqi Freedom. And uh, interestingly, the Hawkeye is, a, is, a, is an asset that's usually used for air intercept control. In this case, we started a whole new mission. The mission was Airborne Battlefield Command and Control. It's not a mission that we were really trained to, but there was so much interference in the region, uh, electromagnetic interference, that the troops on the ground couldn't communicate with the folks back in the Combined Air Operations Center. The command and control elements couldn't communicate with the four line of troops. So what we did is we started talking to the Ford Air Controllers, and they're now called the JTAC, the Joint Tactical Air Controllers. We, we communicated with them via radios. And we were able to communicate with them where the chaos couldn't because we could get close enough. We would fly right over the forward line of troops and maybe not right over them. If you remember when, when the opening salvos in Iraq began, the forward line of troops was going from Kuwait up to Baghdad. Interestingly, this was the first time in history, the first time in history where we didn't have a carpet bombing campaign leading up to the war. We integrated close air support and the bombing campaign with the troops. And the reason we were able to do that is because the precision uh, guided munitions that we now had available, uh, because of the technology advancements that this country uh, really led on. And those technology advancements were not only good for me as a pilot, they were good for the troops on the ground. And we were able to integrate and fight what was really, uh, at the time, it was the most humane war ever fought. Uh, and we actually had the quickest victory. We, none of us imagined that the victory would happen as quick as it, as it happened. It was a matter of a couple of weeks. Now, don't get me wrong, there were insurgents that came in afterwards, foreign fighters from Syria and Iran and other places. If you remember, we damaged uh, al Zarqawi in Afghanistan, for example. And when he was damaged, guess where he got care? He went to Uday Hussein's hospital in Baghdad. So we damaged al Zarqawi in Afghanistan. He got care in Baghdad. And then he started al-Qaeda in Iraq, if you remember that that period of, uh, of, of Iraqi history. Interestingly, uh, this mission that we did, uh, Airborne Battlefield Command and Control, we had troops on the ground, they were in contact with the enemy, and they had to communicate with somebody, that being us, uh, because we were the only ones they could talk to, and they started asking us for what, what they needed. And we would ask them, what are you in contact with? Is it troops? Is it ground personnel carriers? Is it tanks? What are you in contact with? And what we did inside the Hawkeye is we did a weapon to target pairing exercise. We found the right bomb to match the right target, and then we'd look at the air tasking order. We'd find out what assets were airborne and did they have the right weapons for that target. You know, you got to make sure you use, for example, uh, you don't want to use a GPS guided bomb to take a tank. Why? Because tanks move and the GPS coordinates are stagnant, which means your bomb will miss. So you need laser guided munitions if you're going to take a moving target. So these are the kind of things we did in the Hawkeye. We found the right weapon 
you know, if you have, depending on the size of the target, what you're up against, you might need a 500, bomb, a 500 pound bomb or a 2,000 pound bomb. You need the right kind of guidance system. Uh, so we did the weapon and target pairing exercise, but then you also had a problem with the fact that there were uh, the aircraft, they had to go deeper into country based on where the troops might have been, which meant that we had to orchestrate a tanker plan, which is very difficult because uh, tankers are, you know, to the enemy, a high value asset. We had to make sure they were protected, that they could get close enough to, to, to make sure that the, the aircraft could get to the forward line of troops. And also, if, if we couldn't get them frontside tanking, we orchestrated backside tanking. But what we did in the E-2 Hawkeye is, is we were the quarterbacks in the sky for the war in Iraq. And, and, and you know, um, it wasn't just tanking, it wasn't just, you know, command and control of the airborne assets to make sure we got the right bomb on the right target at the right time. Uh, we were providing strategic direction for the course of war based on what we were hearing on the radio and seeing on the, on the radar and, and other things. So, so, so what I'm trying to say here is that what happens in Afghanistan and what happens in Iraq matters to people like me. That's one of the major reasons I ran for Congress when I ran. Because what's, what we see happening right now in many cases uh, is, is problematic, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, we, we saw really the most humane and the most successful war ever fought. And then we watched it kind of degrade as foreign fighters got more and more, uh, and, and, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq and these terrorists got more and more involved in this. And then what we saw is uh, the president... <laughs> So, for your next one, comment on the Send it out of Hi, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to After Karzai, assessing the Afghan elections and the future of the U.S. Afghan relationship. Uh, it's a Hill briefing and also a public briefing hosted by the Foreign Policy Initiative, uh, a 501c3 nonpartisan not for profit organization uh, founded by William Crystal Weekly Standard, Robert Kagan of Brookings Institution, uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman, uh, former Undersecretary of Defense Policy, and, and Dan Sinor. Um, and um, we're an organization that, that tries to make the argument for continuing U.S. global leadership in matters of security, uh, trade, and economy. Uh, democracy and human rights, and uh, as part of that, uh, further into that mission, uh, we're, ho we're hosting this briefing today on Afghanistan. And by the way, I know the, uh, the opening speakers, uh, Congressman Brian Stein, they've wrapped up the votes. Um, well, I'll start. This, this, uh, I'll just provide a quick overview of the conversation, and also maybe be a good time to go through the bios of the, of the speakers. Um, and uh, hopefully, Brian Stein will be there. Otherwise, we'll just start with uh, um, Hamid with his briefing and, and go on with the briefing. But, as, as you all know, uh, on April 5th, Afghanistan uh, held momentous elections. Uh, there was a lot of consternation, a lot of concern how these would go, um, but they, they seem to have, have, to have gone fairly well, um, all things considered. Uh, of course, there were some allegations of irregularities, voter fraud, but that's the sort of thing that, that, that seems to happen in a lot of elections in that part of the world. And I think on balance, it's been a, a, a success, and we've seen right now uh, interim results in which Abdul Abdullah, former foreign minister, uh, and Ashraf Ghani, former finance minister, appear to have uh, emerged as the front runners and, and may uh, run, uh, participate in a runoff election on May 28th. And it's worth pointing out that this election occurred amid uh, great uncertainties, uh, including the, the lack of a bilateral security agreement between the United States and Afghanistan. Uh, this agreement has been approved by the Loya Jirga, uh, Afghanistan representative body, but President Karzai, for a variety of different reasons, which our speakers will discuss, decided to punt on approving or disproving it and leaving that decision to his successor. Uh, and uh, if no decision is made uh, soon, there is a risk that uh, U.S. troops uh, may pull out completely by the end of the year, though it, it's clear that the, uh, many in the uh, current administration want U.S. troops, uh, at least some presence, uh, after 2014. Um, in addition, uh, another uncertainty that, that the elections faced uh, was a security situation. In particular, there were worries that the Taliban 
and other groups, violent extremists, might try to disrupt them. But in, in fact, what we've seen lately is a, a relative lull, uh, especially in the cities uh, with regarding violence. And, and, and last, a lot of economic uncertainty, which the speakers can go into, but um, given uh, the lack of clarity where Afghanistan will, Afghanistan will be in 2015 in terms of the BSA and the larger security situation, uh, the economy has um, had uh, mild bumps, but it still has been on a positive trajectory. So here to help us think through uh, and assess the April 5th election in Afghanistan and where it's going, as well as to think through where uh, the future of the U.S.-Afghan relationship is going, we have, uh, in addition to Congress Brian Stein, who I'll introduce when he arrives, we have four terrific speakers. Who I'll just quickly go over their bios. Um, the first speaker is Hamid uh, Arsalan, who is a program officer for Middle East and North Africa programs at the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, D.C. Uh, he travels frequently to Afghanistan and regularly meets with political leaders, um, provincial council members, business and religious leaders, and members of parliament. He also regularly briefs uh, U.S. civilian and military officials about Afghan domestic politics, about culture and religion, uh, about the terror groups. Oh, Congressman Brian Stein's here. Uh, please, please, please come on. Um, thank you. We were trying to uh, move the ball forward while, uh, while you were getting rid of uh, getting the votes. So, um, if I may introduce you very quickly. Um, thank you. Our, our, our uh, speaker has come. Uh, Congressman Jim Bridenstine, who um, uh, was elected to serve in Oklahoma's 1st District in 2013 as a member of the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, Congressman Bridenstine is a Navy pilot and a combat veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, thank you for your service. Um, after graduating from Rice University uh, with a BA in Economics, uh, Business, and Psychology, he joined the Navy became a fly and flying combat missions off the USS Abraham Lincoln in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, in Operation Southern Watch in Iraq, and Operation Shock and Awe in Iraq. Uh, later, he transitioned to the F-18 uh, Hornet Fighter at the Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center, the parent command of Top Gun, where he flew Red Air uh, as an instructor. He subsequently got an MBA from Cornell and then re returned to Tulsa, where he was a, a community leader. Uh, and, um, and he was elected again in 2013. So there's, thank you very much for coming and, and offering your comments thank about you. Afghanistan. Thank you. So when he said I was elected again in 2013, people are saying, what election was in 2013? <laughs> well, I uh, just went unopposed. Uh, so so I, got, I got elected in 2012, and uh, we got elected already again in, in, in 2014. So uh, we're pretty thrilled about it. But uh, thank you for the great introduction. and. Um, I'd like to just kind of share some of my experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq and why these uh, regions are so important to our country and to the world. Um, when I first uh, got to my first fleet squadron, the AW-113, it's an E-2 Hawkeye squadron, uh, in Point Magoo, California. Raise your hand if you're familiar with an E-2 Hawkeye. I lost an election in 2006, and everybody said, look, you got to fire Rumsfeld. Look, we got to get out of Iraq. And all these things started happening. And guess what? The E did. Rumsfeld resigned. But what happened after that? The surge. And everybody said it couldn't be done. It couldn't work. It was politically unpopular. The president of the United States today, who was then Senator Obama, in fact, I've got the quote here. In fact, actually, I don't have the quote here. But what, what he said is that, and actually, I think I do have it, either of <laughs> Whether it's quoted or not, here's the gist of his statement. That this has been tried, and it failed, and we shouldn't try it again. That was the president's, the, the Senator Obama's statement when, when, uh, when things started unraveling. President Bush said, look, uh, I'm the president, we're going to surge, and he surged anyway. And guess what? It was overwhelmingly successful. Republicans were telling him not to do it. Democrats were telling him not to do it. Uh, and he did it anyway, and it was successful. And interestingly, uh, you know, uh, it came time for the Status of Forces Agreement in Iraq to, to, to end, and the president couldn't get a new, the, the current president, Obama, couldn't get a new Status of Forces Agreement. And so guess what? Our troops precipitously withdrew. And I, I want to read to you what he said. This was Senator Obama in 2006. In 2006 he said, a premature withdrawal from Iraq would, quote, leave behind a security vacuum filled with terrorism, chaos, ethnic cleansing, and genocide that could engulf large swaths of the Middle East and endanger America. That's what Senator Obama said would happen if we were to have a precipitous withdrawal in Iraq. Interestingly, 
uh, he went ahead and campaigned saying he was going to withdraw troops from Iraq. And when he became president, he did just that. And when he came time to withdraw troops, and it wasn't because he wanted to, it was because he couldn't get a status of forces agreement agreed to. And here's what he said. He confidently asserted that, quote, these terrorists will fail to achieve their goals. Iraqis are a proud people. They have no interest in endless destruction. This was a complete reversal in his opinion. And what we're finding now in Iraq is that he was right in 2006 and he was wrong in 2010. We're seeing in the Anbar province uh, massive degradation. We're seeing Ramadi and Fallujah controlled by ISIS and, and you know, Al-Qaeda aligned groups. And now we're seeing it not only in western Iraq, we're seeing it in eastern Iraq. Um, and they're, they're expanding their territory. And the troops that we have, that I say we, the troops that the Iraqis have, um, are not able to, to defend against themselves. And cities are falling. And there's chaos. And the people that are there supposedly providing security are not providing it. And farmers are actually saying, look, we're out of here and they're leaving. This is creating chaos. And the reason is because we didn't achieve a status of forces agreement in Iraq. And where are we now in Afghanistan? We're in a position now in Afghanistan where we don't have a status of forces agreement. We desperately need one. And now we, we've had an election, which is good, in Afghanistan. 60% of uh, adults that were eligible to vote voted, which is a, a, a tremendous success. Uh, it is true that nobody got 50%, which is actually quite indicative of the fact that while there was corruption and there probably was some voter fraud, it wasn't so overwhelming that it enabled somebody to win over the others uh, illegitimately. But now we're in a position where we've got to get this status of forces agreement achieved in Afghanistan, and we need to maintain at least 10,000 troops, which is what the generals in Afghanistan are calling for, so that we don't have in Afghanistan the same scenario that is now developed in Iraq. And there are too many of us who have served our country, who have shed our sweat and our blood uh, not only for our country, but for peace and stability in the world. There are too many of us who have sacrificed to watch what happened in Iraq happen again in Afghanistan. That's how important <clears throat> what these gentlemen and lady are talking about here today. And, uh, and it's an honor to be here. Um, I appreciate you guys waiting for me to, to get here and, and make the opening statement. But, uh, but this, is, uh, this is something that is near and dear to those of us who have served. And it's, of course, something that's uh, critically important to peace and stability in the world. So thank you guys for being here, and it's, uh, it's an honor to be Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Bridestein, for uh, helping to put in perspective what's, uh, where we are today and what's at stake today in Afghanistan. And, uh, again, thank you for your service, both uh, in the military and uh, here on Capitol Hill. Thank you, sir. Um, I, so, moving ahead, uh, I think we'll turn to our speakers, and uh, I think we'll start with Hamid Arsalan, who I, who I just uh, began introducing. But um, uh, just to conclude, he's, he's a program officer at, at National Endowment for Democracy, spends a lot of time in Afghanistan, also uh, talking to leaders in Afghanistan, as well as briefing. Uh, policymakers and lawmakers here in D.C. Uh, and uh, he's a native of Afghanistan himself, so uh, on top of that, he, uh, he's lived it and knows it. So thank you, Hamid, and we'll start with you. Um, thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging uh, FBI uh, for hosting such timely events. And also, it's an honor for me to be in such a distinguished panel and also uh, in such a distinguished place. Uh, my remarks will be brief and hopefully to the point. Uh, I, I, I will not be uh, talking mostly about the headlines that you're hearing uh, in the news these days, but pretty much about what really this vote uh, meant uh, for Afghanistan and for the Afghans. Uh, many of you know that 2014 has been the 